Oh, we're doing another iceberg. Since you guys love the cartoon myths and urban legends iceberg so much, I thought why not bring you guys the video games myth and urban legends iceberg as well. So if you don't know what an iceberg is, it is a chart that ranks the most known of a topic at the top to least known at the bottom. This specific iceberg was created by Midnight and Silent Chatterbox 52 on the Icebergs chart website and I want to give you guys a big thank you for the support these last couple weeks on my last three videos. Um, I didn't know how well my last video would do because it wasn't an iceberg and I've never done one of those before. And other than the mispronunciations, uh, which I apologize for and I will work on, you guys really liked it, so more to come in the future, I guess. So yeah, if you enjoy this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Uh, comment if you liked the video, any critiques, any recommendations you know I read every comment I at least I try to uh, and I want to thank you guys for being so interactive it's really the best part about all of this anyways and I also want to announce that I just created a Twitter it's Frytopia YT the link will be in the description uh, I also got the community tab finally so I kind of have a little update about how my schedule is gonna be in the future so make sure to give that a look if you're interested so anyways, I want to thank you guys for 3,000 subscribers, and I do want to put a disturbing content warning for this video because some things can be a little creepy. I don't think there's anything that bad, but I still want to put it out there just in case. But as always, I'm Fright from Frightopia, and let's get into the video. Hero Brian. It's only appropriate that this iceberg starts off with Hero Brian. If you don't know who Herobrine is, he is not only one of the biggest icons of Minecraft Urban Legends, but of all video game Urban Legends, maybe even the biggest. It is the result of a long-lasting creepypasta made by the Minecraft community about a Steve skin with white eyes. Herobrine, who my little cousin used to call Hero O'Brien, uh, first made his appearance on the internet in August of 2010 on the 4chan's Paranormal Board. The post didn't really gain any traction at the time, and it has since been deleted, but it was about OP's experience with a mysterious character named Herobrine in his single player world that uh, created a bunch of pyramids and tunnels in his world. Herobrine then became popular when streamer Copeland created a bunch of screenshots where he photoshopped Herobrine into him, which he showed his stream and then he ended that stream with a hoax where he encountered Herobrine. There is a lot of lore that has been created around the character. Um, one of the most popular theories is that it's Notch's dead brother, which he embedded into the game. This can obviously be debunked because Notch does not have a brother. Anyways, Herobrine is one of the biggest names in video game myths history, and he has spawned many mods, maps, animations, you name it, in the Minecraft community. The developers of Minecraft even liked the rumor so much that they created a uh, kind of like a reference to him in their change logs from beta 1.6.6 to 1.16.2 where they would put removed hero brine in the change logs the possibility of this character showing up in your single player world used to terrify kids like me back in the day and uh hero brine would always have a place in my heart because of that bigfoot in gta san andreas when grand theft auto san andreas was originally released in 2004 it instantly got a lot of backlash due to the hot coffee mod which i will unfortunately have to cover in the second tier so Buckle up for that one. This caused the developers to eventually remove the game and re-release it without the mod and the code. So basically while one part of the San Andreas fan base was raving about that, another part was raving about possible Bigfoot sightings. This rumor stated that people have seen sightings of Bigfoot in the dark countryside forests of the map. The typical areas were Mount Chiliad, Baco Beyond, or Shady Cabin. There were many pictures and videos of reported Bigfoot sightings, however these were mostly just edited, photoshopped, or just modded into the game. So many people dug into the game's code hoping to find a glimpse of Bigfoot, however they didn't find anything. Also, Terry Donovan stated about the game in 2005 that there is no Bigfoot, just like in real life. This quote pretty much confirms that he's not in the game, however people took this as a hint to keep searching. Some people even believe that the evidence of Bigfoot is hidden within the phantom files of the game, along with other mythical creatures that the developers of the game don't want people finding out about in the code. L is real. 2401. Super Mario 64, the legendary game for the Nintendo 64, 
has a statue in the middle of the courtyard of the castle that is a giant star with some blurry writing under it. Depending on where you are standing, the writing can be interpreted to say Eternal Star, you know, which makes sense because it's a star statue, or the legendary El Israel 2401. The theory was that there was 2,401 coins in the game, and if you collected all of them, then you can return to the statue, and Luigi would then become a playable character in the game. This theory, however, never panned out, but in July 25th of 2020, 24 years and a month after the game was originally released, source code was leaked online, which led to the discovery of an unedited model of Luigi. See, this game was originally supposed to be a two-player game with Mario and Luigi as the playable characters. However, the Nintendo 64 could not support this, so Luigi was taken out of the game. But since Luigi's player model and voice lines are in the game, L is real. Man, do I love an underdog story. Missing No. Missing No, which is short for Missing Number, is a glitch Pokemon that can be found and caught in many of the early Pokemon games, most notably Pokemon Red and Blue, by performing certain glitches, such as the Old Man glitch. The encounter of Missing No causes a lot of visual glitches in the game, and upon his capture, it even increases the amount of items in the player's sixth slot by 128. This is one of the most famous glitches of all time, and has been cited as one of the biggest reasons for the emergence of glitch hunting and speedrunning in the gaming community today. Mew Under the Truck In Pokemon Red and Blue, there is a secret ledge with a pickup truck near it, near the SS Anne ship in Vermilion City. Since the only way to reach it is by using Surf, which is not available at the time of you reaching the ship under those specific circumstances, it should be impossible for one to reach the truck. People, however, have figured out that if you trade a Pokemon that knows Surf, over to that game, or you intentionally lose a battle after getting the HM for Surf on the ship, you can Surf before the ship leaves and reach that location. Since there's really no reason for that ship to be there and Nintendo hasn't given a reason on why it is, people have speculated that the legendary Pokemon Mew can be caught, or even there is a very rare item underneath. Even though this has been disproven, later releases of the game include an item underneath the truck as an homage to the rumor. Minus World The Minus World is a glitch for the legendary game Super Mario Bros. It is reached through performing a complicated glitch on World 1 Level 2. Once the glitch is completed, the player will see three tubes in a warp zone. If the player chooses either the right or the left tube, they will enter the Minus World, but if they enter the middle one, the player will get taken to World 5 Level 1. The Minus World is a underwater level exactly like World 7 Level 2. The one difference, however, is that the user cannot exit the level unless the player restarts the game or has a game over. E.T. Atari Landfill In September of 1983, 10 to 20 semi-trucks full of Atari equipment, systems, cartridges were buried in a landfill in El Paso, Texas. This was mostly due to the 1983 video game crash, where the video game market was oversaturated with video games and consoles, mostly due to poor business practices by the companies, especially Atari. Since distributors couldn't sell as many games as they had, and they were getting a lot of games returned, they returned the games to Atari. So Atari basically had millions of game cartridges that they couldn't sell. Cited as one of the games that led to Atari's failure was the infamous E.T. the Extraterrestrial. If you have not heard of this legendary game, it is cited as one of the, if not the, worst game of all time. Due to the success of the movie turned video game, Raiders of the Lost Ark on the Atari, Warner Communications wanted to hop on this trend and they purchased the rights to the E.T. story for between 20 million to 25 million dollars. The head programmer for Raiders of the Lost Ark Howard Scott Warshaw was given the tall task of completing the game in five weeks so that Atari could sell it during the upcoming holiday season. He only had five weeks because the process for acquiring the rights took a lot longer than they expected. So naturally when the game released it was a total failure. It was critically panned for its poor gameplay and out of the five million cartridges that were created, only 1.5 of them sold in December of 1982, leading to those distributors to just send it back to Atari. 
Since there are apparently 3.5 million cartridges of this game, people believe that most of them were trapped under concrete in the creation of the Atari landfill. Also, the concrete wasn't originally there. The city had to put it in because a lot of the local kids were walking into the landfill and just taking games. So they had to put the concrete there to stop the kids from doing that so they wouldn't get hurt in the landfill. So yeah, with the rumors of the abundance of E.T. the extraterrestrial cartridges, in the landfill, it became less of the Atari landfill and more of the E.T. landfill. This belief lasted until 2013, when Fuel Industries gained six months of full access to the landfill for the filming of their documentary Atari Game Over, in which they excavated the site. Instead of finding millions of E.T. and other game cartridges, they only found about 700,000 cartridges. Only a portion of these cartridges were of the E.T. game, and out of the 700,000 estimated cartridges, only about 1,178 were recovered. One of the ET cartridges was given to the Smithsonian Institution, who called the game a representation of the ongoing challenge of making a good film to a video game adaptation. The decline of Atari, the end of an era for video game manufacturing, and the video game cartridge life cycle. Blowing into cartridges. I'm sure this is something that we all did as kids when we couldn't get our Nintendo game cartridges to work. We would blow into the bottom of the cartridge to get rid of the dust and voila, the game worked just as new. Actually, sorry to break it to you, but it's been debunked. Yeah, disappointing, I know. In reality, blowing into cartridges is nothing to help and it can actually damage your games due to the moisture in your breath. Lavender Town Syndrome. The Lavender Town Syndrome is a creepypasta turned internet myth about the song that plays when players enter Lavender Town in Pokemon Red and Green. Allegedly, the high frequencies in the song uh, could only be heard by teens and kids, causing mass hysteria in Japan, who saw a peak in suicide illnesses. This is obviously fake due to there being no reports of this happening in Japan, as well as there being no peak and yeah, so it's an illnesses in Japan following the game's release. Nonetheless, the story has given us one of the most infamous creepypastas about video games we have ever seen. Hidden Palace Zone. Hidden Palace Zone was a zone that was removed late in the development of Sonic the Hedgehog 2 on the Sega Mega Drive. However, a completed version of the zone was included in the 2013 remaster of the game, as well as Sonic Origins. This zone was an underground cave that included a lot of sparkling gems and rocks. Before it was released in these future games, players were aware of its existence due to screenshots of it being sent as promotional material to gaming magazines. Some clues about this supposed level were seen through files of the game, as well as a leaked prototype online. Diablo 2 Secret Cow Level the Secret Cow level, also known as Moo Moo Farm, is a easter egg level in Diablo 2. This can be accessed by combining Word's Leg and a Tone of Town Portal in the Horridric Cube, whatever that means, which creates a portal in the Act 1 starting area. To access this level, the player must also be playing on the same difficulty in which they have already beaten the game on. So for example, to access the game on normal difficulty, the player must have already beat the game on normal difficulty, if that makes sense. The level is a relatively small area with a bunch of mobs called Hellbovines, which players used to use to farm XP until the XP levels were nerfed in a patch. There is also the Cow King, which if it is killed by a player that has not already killed it before, everybody in that level will get the kill. Once you get the kill, you will no longer be able to access the portal on that same difficulty again. Shooting the Duck Hunt Dog for those of you who played the original Duck Hunt, didn't you hate that smug dog that would laugh at your failures? And I bet those of you with pretty short fuses have tried to shoot the dog from time to time, only to find out that unfortunately, it's impossible. Well, despite popular belief, there's actually a game where you can shoot the dog. A version of Duck Hunt called Versus Duck Hunt was released to arcades when the NES version was released. This arcade version included some different modes and harder difficulties than in the NES version. And one of these harder difficulties included the dog jumping up to get the birds while you were shooting. So, after all of these years of that mocking dog thinking he's so cool, players could finally shoot him. <laughs>
If the player does shoot the dog, whether intentionally or unintentionally, the dog's face will become damaged and he will wear a cast with some crutches. The player is also awarded with a game over, which is worth it to some. It really is. Ocarina of Triforce. This entry refers to the legendary urban legend following the release of the 1998 game Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. In screenshots of early development, the Triforce was shown, leading players to believe that it would play a huge part in the game. When the game released, it turned out not to be. However, the players can obtain a single part of it. However, it was not able to be used and it only served a purpose to drive the story. The inventory screen also had a blackened image of the Triforce, which led people to believe that you could find it somehow. One of the most famous rumors of how to obtain it was by playing a secret ocarina song called Overture of Sages before obtaining the Master Sword. This was proven false when people looked through the game's code and found no Overture of Sages song as well as no Triforce item. Pokemon Button Mashing Now this is something that a lot of us probably did when we were little, or even still do today. Of course I am talking about the common belief that mashing a button, most commonly the A button, or a combination of buttons increases your chances of capturing a Pokemon. It turns out, and I'm sorry to break the news once again, that it has no effect on catch rate. A Redditor put it best, it doesn't affect it at all, but just about everyone I know still does it, simply because we want to believe it does. Mount Chiliad Mystery Okay, so researching this topic really made my brain hurt, so I'm going to attempt to explain this mystery to you. Inside the cable car station at the peak of Mount Chiliad, there's a map painted on the wall which seems to be a map of the mountain itself along with the locations of potentially strange items. There is a symbol above the map of the mountain which is called the Eye of Providence or the All Seeing Eye which is believed to represent the Illuminati or even a UFO. There is a viewing platform that has right nearby that says come back when your story is complete. This has been figured out to be a reference to the Easter egg that appears when a player returns to the mountain after 100% completing the story mode. When the player has completed the story mode and returns to the mountain at 3 a.m. while it is raining, a UFO can be seen hovering above the mountain. The UFO is widely believed to be a hologram because when players shoot at it or explode it, uh, it doesn't affect the UFO and it also disappears if players get too far away from it or too close to it. There are a lot of mysteries and theories that surround the mountain as well as the map of the mountain itself. My guess is that this specific entry is talking about the jetpack theory, which believes that there is a jetpack that can be obtained on the mountain. If you overlay the map of the mountain over the mountain itself, flip it horizontally, and significantly upscale it. The jetpack symbol on the diagram is directly above Fort Zancudo, a military base. The theory is that this is the location where a jetpack can be found. However, it is believed that this can be obtained only if the player finds all 50 UFO parts. The belief is that a UFO would show up at that location and the jetpack would be unlocked. However, it is most likely that the jetpack marking was a foreshadowing of the Doomsday Heist in GTA Online, in which the thruster is introduced. Doug Ratman Huge spoiler warning for the plot of the Portal franchise, so if you do not want to be spoiled, please skip the next entry in the timestamps below. Doug Ratman, also known as the Ratman, is an important character to the plot of the Portal franchise. However, the only signs of him in the game are through Easter egg rooms, in which players stumble across his dens, which are scattered with trash and have incoherent writings on the walls. To connect the storylines of the two Portal games and tell Doug Ratman's story, a comic called Portal 2 Lab Rat was written. Ratman was the only scientist that survived the neurotoxin attack on the compound, which killed off the rest of his colleagues. He is also the one to select Chell, the protagonist of the series, to be the one to fight against Gladys, the supercomputer villain of the story. Ratman suffers from schizophrenia, which is evident through his incoherent writings on the walls, and at the start of the comic, he only has two pills left, which he is planning to use at the end of the day. At the start of the comic, he is watching Chell complete the final stages of the original Portal game. 
He takes his pills and follows Shell to the surface after she destroys Gladys. She gets dragged back by a party escort bot, and instead of leaving the compound, Ratman decides to go back to rescue her. He discovers Chell in a cryo chamber, but since the explosion destroyed the main power grid, he has to figure out how to reach the chamber itself. Ratman has a companion cube with him at all times that when he does not take his medicine, he is able to communicate to. But since he took his pills before following her outside, he is unable to get the help of the companion cube and chooses the wrong way to try to reach Chell. This causes him to get shot in the leg by a turret and pass out. When he wakes up, he is back into his psychosis, and his companion cube tells him that the only way he can save Chell is by putting her into a stasis in the cryo chamber, which he does before going to sleep inside of a relaxation chamber. Many of these plot elements have been shown through many of these easter egg dens that are found in the original Portal game, in which Ratman writes about his obsession with his companion cube, along with warnings to Chell about potential hazards that could be ahead. After the events of the comic, Ratman could have died from his leg wound, however Eric Walpile has refused to comment on whether he is alive or not. In Portal 2, there is more scribblings that have been seen so this could be seen as evidence as him still being alive. There is even an achievement that can be gained in the second game and also when a character stands near one of the murals in one of his dens you can hear a voice crying out in mumbling gibberish which is thought to be Ratman. Hell Valley Sky Trees Hell Valley Sky Trees are entities that can be seen in the background of specific worlds in Super Mario Galaxy 2. They are seen in the backgrounds of World 5's Shiverburn Galaxy, as well as World S's Grandmaster Galaxy. They just kind of watch you and no other characters in the game really acknowledge their existence. These have been theorized to represent Kodama, which are tree spirits from Japanese folklore, or even skinwalkers or shadow people. Lumio City Ghost this entry refers to the urban legend surrounding an easter egg in the Pokemon X and Y game released in 2013. When a player enters the second floor of a building in Lumio City, the music stops and the lights in the room flash. A ghost girl appears and glides towards the player in a sort of frozen walking animation, and the ghost girl says, no, you're not the one, before floating away and vanishing. One rumor is that the character helps the player acquire some super rare ghost type legendary, while another rumor states that if a player with a specific trainer ID enters the room, then they'd be the one. Mario Party Anti-Piracy Screens This entry refers to a creepypasta video that includes a fake anti-piracy screen for the Mario Party game for the Nintendo DS that was uploaded by a YouTuber named Joey Perleone. The video shows a player starting up a minigame before the game glitches out and an anti-piracy screen shows up. It displays characters from the game either behind bars or looking at you while you're behind bars, while creepy music plays. Text above it reads, Piracy is no party. It is a serious crime to pirate video games. Please power up the system and report this stolen software immediately. It then leaves a link to the Nintendo website. Petscop. Petscop is a horror YouTube series that is meant to resemble the popular YouTube Let's Plays format. It is a 24 episode series that ran from March 12, 2017 to September 2nd, 2019, which I highly recommend you check out before listening to this tier because I don't want to spoil it for you. Those of you that are still here, the series follows the protagonist Paul, who has a copy of the unreleased game Petscop which was developed by Garliana, I think is how you pronounce it, which was a game for PlayStation. The game just seems like a normal game where the main character called Guardian completes puzzles to gain pets. Though the first four episodes of the series seem to be Paul creating these videos for a specific person in mind, Paul soon acknowledges that the videos have gained a large audience on YouTube and then continues to narrate these games for this specific unnamed individual, who he even talks to on the phone from time to time. The copy of the game that Paul has even included a step-by-step -step instructions to reach a hidden place in the game called New Maker Plane. As Paul progresses through this game, references to real-life events reveal that this game was intended for a person named Marvin, who kidnapped their own kid named Care, who he believes to be the reincarnation of his friend Lena who went missing. 
There is a huge focus of the topic of rebirth in this game, and a girl named Bella is unsuccessfully reborn into a girl named Tiara. Paul soon realizes that there are connections to his own family in the story, and it is also believed that Bella and Marvin are also playing the game at the same time as Paul, so some of the episodes may actually be from their perspective. Marvin asks Paul to help him find locations and landmarks in New Maker Plain in order for him to reenact the rebirth of Karen and Selena. During these discoveries of landmarks, Paul realizes that these are references to real life locations. It is widely speculated that Paul went to visit one of these real life locations, just never to be heard from again. This is because the uploads continue after Paul is gone with nobody narrating. If you found this interesting and you still want to check it out, I will leave a link to the Petscop channel in the description. Polybius. Polybius is a popular urban legend about a 1981 arcade game called Polybius that was supposedly part of a government experiment in Portland, Oregon. It was supposedly produced by a company called Sinus Locken, I think. I'm, I gave that a wild shot. I, there's no way I'm going to be able to pronounce that. I'll leave it on the screen. Which the word itself has been described to be not quite idiomatic German for sensory deprivation. The game has been described to be extremely addicting to the point where huge lights would form and people would be fighting over who got to play next. Men in Black were reported to collect data from the game from time to time, which is widely speculated to be information about the psychoactive effects of the game. People who played the game reported symptoms such as hallucinations, night terrors, insomnia, amnesia, and the game suddenly disappeared a month after it appeared. People claim to remember playing this game, however it just never existed. These memories of this game are most likely due to a mixture of stories that have came out at the time about people getting sick playing games, and stories about the FBI raiding arcades for suspected gambling in the 1980s. However, this urban legend has spawned numerous pop culture references, as well as games made to simulate what the game might have been like. So yeah, that was tier one of the video game myths and urban legends iceberg. I just want to thank you guys so much again for watching. Um, the support lately on this channel has been amazing, and I just thank you guys so much for that. So yeah, if you enjoyed the video, um, and this is your first video you've seen of mine, I'd appreciate a sub, a like, a comment. Uh, it really helps me in the algorithm, and it pushes us out to more people that would potentially enjoy my content. Yeah, once again, maybe give my Twitter a follow going to post on there occasionally. And yeah, once again, I'm Fright from Frightopia, and thank you for watching.